The following message was preached from the pulpit of Bible Baptist Church, Oak Harbor, Washington. Turn to Romans chapter 8 and verse number 14, and our text tonight is going to take us down to verse number 27. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse number 14. If you'll follow along once again as we look into the Word of God. The Bible says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Well, we've already noted this morning that this chapter uh, features the work of the Holy Spirit. He is indeed preeminent. As we mentioned, capital S Spirit is found 19 times in this one chapter alone, as opposed to just one time prior, that was in the fifth chapter. And in the message that we preached this morning, uh, we brought out two great truths uh, from the first part of this chapter concerning the Holy Spirit. Uh, We talked about his indwelling, the fact that when we become a child of God, when we are saved, that the Spirit of God comes and lives within us. He's received by us at the time of salvation and he abides forever. Now, the Bible talks about that in a number of places. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, the Bible says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. And we do well to recognize and understand the fact that this physical body that we have transports around the God of heaven through the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. And uh, we don't belong to ourselves anymore because we have been bought with a price. But the Bible talks about this wonderful truth of the abiding presence of God. Wonderful truth indeed. And then we talked about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in verse number 13, uh, the Bible talks about Uh, through the Spirit, mortifying the deeds of the body. That is something that uh, uh, really is talking about the fact that the Spirit of God who dwells within us also wants to have control of our life. He wants to lead us and and for us to yield to him, uh, not to go our own way. And uh, this has also not only been taught here in the book of Romans, but uh, in other passages of Scripture For example, in Galatians chapter 5, the Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, 
and these are contrary the one to the other. And uh, we've talked quite a bit about the two natures of a Christian, the fact that we still have our old sinful nature that takes us back to Adam, which is now dead, but it's still very much uh, effective and working in our life and wants to wrest back control of our life. But we also have a new nature, the nature of God, which cannot sin. And uh, through the Spirit of God, God wants to lead us and control our lives. And so there is this conflict that we experience as Christians. We saw that in chapter number 7 in particular, where Paul was expressing that. He said, the good that I would, I do not, and that which I would not, that I do. And I think we can all relate to that in some shape or other. But understanding, not just to use that as an excuse as to, well, you know, Christians sin, so I guess it's okay. No, because God gives us the way of victory, and we are learning about that here in the 8th chapter in particular. Well, tonight we want to continue on because, as you've already seen in our text, the Spirit of God is mentioned time and time again. And uh, for the message tonight, I want to bring out three works of the Holy Spirit relative to you and I as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, in addition to the fact that he indwells us and he seeks and wants to empower us, to infill us, the Spirit of God converts, first of all, and then the Spirit of God confirms, and then lastly, he comforts. And uh, these are the three points that I want to bring out. There's so much more we could, but trying to get through the book of Romans, we have to uh, just pick and choose a few times. But the key thought is that he brings us into this relationship with God, and he gives us the reassurance that we need, and he represents us in his praying for us. And we saw that there as we read just a few moments ago. So tonight as we think once again about the blessed Spirit of God, who is the third person of the Trinity, that's the way that we express it. He is a part of the Godhead and very much God, very much a person, very much uh, uh, working in, in our life and active in so many different ways. But tonight we want to see, first of all, that he is the agent of our conversion. You and I would not have been saved apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. And I want to explain a few things here, but let's look at verse number 14 and 15, because the Bible says here, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And conversion, converting or saving a soul is the distinctive work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, you may or may not uh, have understood this or even realized this, but when you think back of how you came to Jesus Christ, you would uh, perhaps understand some of the things that the Spirit of God was doing. For example, if you look back to John chapter 16 and uh, looking at verse number 7, which we read this morning, uh, we see that the Spirit of God will do a work of conviction. He'll do a work of conviction. John chapter 16 and verse 7, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And so this is really talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in producing conviction. And let me say this, that if God has led you to someone to share the gospel with them, it's very important that we understand that we ourselves as soul winners depend on the Spirit of God. You can't talk anyone into salvation. Well, you might talk them into praying a prayer or doing something like that, but as far as genuine salvation, it is the work of the Spirit of God to bring conviction. We read about several examples of that, even in the book of Acts, when Peter was preaching the gospel on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that the men of Israel who were listening were pricked in their hearts. They were pricked in their hearts, convicted by the Spirit of God. 
In Acts chapter 9, as Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, uh, when he met the Lord there, Jesus said, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. Uh, And I think that Paul was experiencing that pricking or that conviction of the Holy Ghost right back from the time that he stood by and watched Stephen being stoned to death after hearing him preach. You know, conviction always comes through the preaching of the Word of God, and and, and so the Bible is the agent, but the Spirit of God will take the Word of God and bring conviction. Later on in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 24, as Paul was preaching to Felix, the Roman governor, and uh, he reasoned with him of sin and of righteousness and, uh, and so forth, and the Bible tells us that Felix trembled. Felix trembled. It wasn't because of what Paul said or the way that Paul said it. It was because the Spirit of God got a hold of his heart and uh, he realized, I'm a guilty sinner before God. And any time a person realizes that, they're going to do one of two things. They're going to shut up their their ears to the gospel and and, and walk away from God or they're going to seek uh, a savior. They're going to seek someone who will deliver them. But let's understand that it is the work of the Spirit of God primarily to bring conviction through the preaching and teaching of God's word. And then not only bringing conviction of sin, but the Holy Spirit illuminates the sinner to see the Savior, to see Jesus Christ. Jesus also said in John 15 and verse number 26, but when the comforter is come, he shall testify of me. And it is the Spirit of God who opens our eyes to the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. And uh, suddenly we can see things in the Bible that we didn't understand before and things about Jesus. And we see what Jesus did and who Jesus is and what he's done for me. That is a work of the Holy Spirit also as he brings us to the Lord. And then when we get saved, the actual act of salvation or regeneration is a work of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, you'll remember there in John chapter 3, Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Talking about being born of the water, being the physical birth, but the spiritual birth is what we need. Being born of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. And so the very miracle of salvation is something that it's not what we do, it's what God does within us and he regenerates us. We are born again by the Spirit of God. And you'll see here in the book of Romans that there is no salvation apart from the Spirit working in our life. Look at verse 14 again. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I trust that you can think in your life that you have that testimony that the Spirit of God led you. Now, every story will be different, but these parts are most important, the leading of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, this verse teaches us that there is no such thing as universal salvation. Well, that's a false doctrine that's taught a lot today, isn't it? Well, we're all God's children. We'll all get there eventually. Well, that would be nice, but it's not true. The fact is, it's those who are led by the Spirit of God, those that are brought and drawn to Christ by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about two kinds of children. Uh, In Ephesians chapter 2, before we were saved, the Bible says we were children of wrath. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10, in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. And so clearly there are two kinds of people in the world, those that are uh, aligned with Satan and those who are the children of God. So there's no place for this teaching that we're all going to be saved eventually. Beloved, that's why we need to preach the gospel. If everybody was to be saved in the end, why would we waste our time? Why would we spend our money? Why would we uh, expend our time in prayer, praying for the the salvation of of the lost? Why would we send evangelists out (laughs) if they're going to be saved anyway? But we understand that there's a great need for the preaching of the word of God 
so that the Spirit of God can do what he can do and only he can do. And so we see that he is the agent in our salvation. But notice also that he makes us twofold a child of God. Verse number 15 here, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the, uh, the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You know, we are the children of God in two ways. And this is really amazing. We are the children of God by birth. All right? And I'm not talking about our physical birth. I'm talking about the new birth. When you're born again, uh, you are born into the family of God. And uh, the Bible says, uh, as many as received him, to them gave he power to be the sons of God. John chapter 1, verse 12. So we are the children of God by birth. And here we're told that we are the children of God by adoption. And the Greek words for sons in both cases are different. Adoption is the Greek word huiothesia, which means to be placed as a son. You know, adoption's a wonderful thing. I don't know how many here in this congregation tonight were adopted into a family. I'll tell you one thing, it makes Brother Bottom an instant grandfather, <laughs> which you became today, right? On the 22nd. And uh, his daughter just adopted, and, uh, and his son-in-law, of course. But what a blessing that is. But when you think about adoption, that is something that you have to want to do. Not everybody is going to adopt. And, and uh, you know, I talk about it with my wife occasionally, and uh, <laughs> then I have to ask if I can get back in the house. <laughs> well, not really, but, you know, ad adoption is a choice. A and when you think about it in the spiritual context that God made a choice to adopt us into his family. And we are adopted. All children should be wanted, those that are born by natural means and those that are adopted. But when you adopt a child, that's really a double want, don't you think? And uh, I find that just uh, an amazing fact in the Bible. Through regeneration, through the new birth, we receive the nature of sons and daughters, of course, but children of God. We receive the nature of sons because we are made partakers of the divine nature. And you can relate that to the human families that we all belong to, that you've heard the exp expression, he's a chip off the old block, <laughs> meaning that that son or that daughter has the characteristics of mom or dad in some fashion, and you can see the likeness. Well, when you're born again by the Spirit of God, regeneration you have you have the nature of God and and that will also be seen but adoption gives us not the nature of sons but the privilege of sons the privilege of sons adoption in the ancient world as it is today was a legal process a legal transaction and when we're adopted by the way we're not made a servant we're not adopted by God to be a Cinderella, so to speak, and to work for him and to labor for him. Look at verse number 15. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. When people were adopted in the Bible times, as well as today, they are brought into a full relationship as a son or a daughter. And so it is with us in God's family. When we are adopted, we, we receive the full rights and privileges we become heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Perhaps one of the better illustrations in the Bible is that of the prodigal son. Because remember when he came back to the father, he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against thee. And he said, if you'll take me back, make me as one of thy hired servants. If you'll just have me back, I'll work for you. I'll just act like I'm one of the, the slaves that you have out there. But what did the father do? He said, oh, no. He put on a ring. He put on the, the robes of a son. He put on uh, shoes on his feet and made him a full son in that family. That's what adoption means. And the Spirit of God makes us twofold a child of God. And he brings us into a family relationship. If you're saved, you're part of the family of God. The family of God. It's not a relationship even that as God had with Israel, Jehovah God had with Israel, but it's a loving familial relationship. 
And it's seen here by the word Abba, Father. We have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now that word Abba comes from the Hebrew root, which literally means daddy, literally means daddy. And that in any family, whatever name you have for your father, hopefully it's a respectful name, uh, not the old man, even though that's a biblical term, but it's not referring to dads, all right? You might call him father, papa, dad, daddy, whatever it is. But that's something that's very, very special and very close in the family. And so we can understand that, but in our relationship with God, it's not a relationship where God is up there and we can only approach him through intermediaries, but we can come to him and just, as it were, sit on his knee and say, Daddy, I need this or can you help me with that? That's the kind of relationship that the Spirit of God gives to us when we are saved. In this family, God is our Heavenly Father. We have a Heavenly Father. And uh, by the way, that term Abba is, Abba is used only two other times in the Bible. And one of those times was when our Lord was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when he said, Abba, Father, can this cup pass from me? He knew what he was facing on the cross. Not the, not the agony of the physical death, but the fact that he would be separated from his father because of our sins. What a dark, uh, awesome moment that was. And, and, and the son called out to his father in that familiar way. And that's how we're taught to pray, by the way. We address our prayers to our heavenly father. We're taught to do that. Even in the so-called Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, when you pray, pray our Father. We don't pray to God in the sense of calling him God or the almighty Jehovah, such as he is. But because of this relationship that we have, we can say, Father, Father. In the human sense, of course, you would go to your father as a child to seek help or to seek something. You wouldn't go to the neighborhood father and say, hey, dad, can you give me this? He would look at you and say, well, I'm not your father. But, you know, in prayer, we pray to our heavenly father in the name of the, whole, of the son and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is a wonderful relationship. This is how we're taught to pray. Not only do we have a heavenly father, but we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, we use that term, don't we? We call each other brother. And that's not just a, a Baptist thing or, or just a, a religious thing. I mean, that is because in Christ we are brothers and sisters. A wonderful expression of our family relationship. And in, when we look, look at Jesus Christ, he's the firstborn who inherits all things. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2 tells us that God has appointed the Son heir of all things. But Jesus said... In John 16, verse 15, all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore, said I, that he, that, uh, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. We are joint heirs. Everything that Christ has, we are part of. These are mind-blowing thoughts. <laughs> I'm setting you up for a week of meditation, right? I mean, really, these are... Because we are in Christ, we are joint heirs. Verse 17 tells us that if children, if you're a child of God, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. And the fact that we are heirs, you know, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4 that we have an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. These are the riches of Christ. And because we are in Christ, and that the Spirit of God has put us in the family of God, we get to enjoy all of these things. That's an amazing thought. Now, the family relationship means that we share in his riches, but also in his sufferings. Christians will suffer for the sake of Christ. We read that here in verse 17. If so be that we 
Suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, suffering is a part of the Christian life. Now, we thank the Lord that we live in a country where there's not a lot of religious persecution. It may be that the worst thing that will happen to you is to be laughed at, mocked, maybe had a door slammed in your face or something like that. But nonetheless, suffering is something that is for Christians. And 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, the Bible says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happen unto you, but rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. In other words, it will be worth it all when we see Christ. And that's what verse 18 says, that whatever we are called upon to suffer, and yes, if you're going to serve God, there will be hardness, there will be hardships, there will be difficulties, there will be opposition. Maybe not to the degree that some of the people we read about in the Bible went through, but there will be suffering. But compared to what awaits us, it's nothing. It's nothing. And that's what verse 18 says. In fact, as we suffer for Christ and struggle, it just causes us to groan for Christ's return. Verse 23 tells us that, and not only they but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, that down payment uh, that the Bible talks about in Ephesians chapter 1. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. And I know that there's a number of you that you just would like to have the Lord come. You get to feel that way after a while. Sometimes when you go through life and you, you see so much and you wonder what's going on and, and, and it just creates a, a yearning for the coming of our Lord. Well, the Bible promises that. There is coming a day when Jesus Christ will return. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians, if you'll turn over there to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, the Apostle Paul is talking about the sufferings that he went through and what he was looking for. In verse number 1 he said, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, now that's just a fancy way of saying this body of clay, we know that if our body of clay were dissolved, which one day it will, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. That's our new body. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. You know, the fact that you have the Holy Spirit is assurance that you have a heavenly home. That's what that's teaching us there. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You see, the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 affirms that we are sealed by that Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption. The abiding presence of the Spirit of God. And you know, full redemption is coming. Back in Romans chapter 8, we see that in verse 11 the latter part of that verse, that he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. The mortal body is this body that's subject to death. And he's going to make it alive by giving us a brand new incorruptible body that will never die. 
And uh, the Bible says it's by his spirit that dwelleth in you. And in verse 23, the latter part of that, waiting for the adoption to which the redemption of the body. Full redemption is coming. And we've said this before, that in the past, when we accepted Christ, we were saved from the penalty of sin. In the present, as we live for Christ, we are being saved or set free from the power of sin. But one of these days, when Christ comes, will be saved from the very presence of sin. That is full salvation, full redemption, and we still wait for the redemption of the body. And so we groan for that in this life. Yes, the Christian life is not a a bed of roses. It's not an easy road to live for Christ, but it will be worth it all. And not just you and I as Christians who groan, but did you know the whole creation is groaning? In verse number 19, the Bible says, for the earnest expectation of the creature. Now that word creature really is a word that means all of creation, all God's critters, all right? The whole creation groaneth or waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God for the creature or creation was made subject to vanity. You know, when man sinned back in the Garden of Eden and sin came into the world, it didn't just affect humankind I mean it changed nature animals became wild and some became very dangerous thorns and thistles grew up that's why we have to weed the garden that's all because of sin and sin has that kind of an effect on everything good that God has done it it messes it up and so the Bible tells us here that the creature or creation is waiting for its own deliverance from the bondage of corruption. In verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. By the way, that's an anti-evolutionary verse, isn't it? The world's not getting better. It's groaning. It's creaking. And, uh, uh, you know, we we can see that if we open our eyes as, as to what's happening. But... Uh, while it has been marred by sin, there is a yearning for the glorious liberty of the children of God. You know what this world, this earth is waiting for? It's not waiting for environmentalists to get elected. (laughs) It's waiting for Jesus to come. And when Jesus comes, there will be a millennial kingdom. And I want you to turn over to Isaiah in the Old Testament, chapter 11, just to give you a glimpse of what is awaiting this old world. We've talked about what's awaiting the believer because of our uh, adoption in, and our, our being part of God's family and children of God. But can you imagine a day, look at uh, Isaiah 11 verse 6, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. And that's not a cockroach, that's a poisonous snake. (laughs) So uh, if you're going to be a parent in the millennium, You just tell your kids, go play with the lions. Go find a snake and put your hand down the snake hole. Won't matter because all of creation is going to be changed. And that's what this world is groaning for. It's under the curse of sin. In fact, one day God's going to burn it all up anyway. But the fact is, during the millennial kingdom, there'll be great changes on the earth. And yes... Nature will be tamed for that thousand years. It's really an interesting subject and we're not getting into it tonight. But here's the good news for you and me. Philippians 1.6 Being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. What's that good work that he began in you and me? It's salvation. And he's going to keep working in your life and changing you and making you and conforming you until Jesus comes and takes us to be with him 
in glory. What a wonderful truth. Praise the Lord for the blessed work of the Holy Spirit and bringing us into a wonderful relationship in the family of God. In fact, Paul, when he thought about it, this is what he said in Ephesians chapter 1, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 14 and 16, he said, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Yes, we thank the Lord for his conversion and bringing us into this relationship. Now, the second thing I want to bring out quickly here tonight is not only does the Holy Spirit convert, but he confirms our relationship with God. If you'll go back to Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8 once again, and look at verse number 16. Very important verse here. The Bible says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. There is a confirming work of the Holy Spirit. You know, Christians can and sometimes do have doubts about their salvation. I think probably most of us at some point have wondered if we're truly saved. Why is that so? Well, there's a number of reasons. What, number one, it could be because of the lies of Satan. You know, the Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. And sometimes, you know, particularly with young Christians, but not always young Christians, uh, maybe we slip back and do something that we know is wrong, and next thing you know, the old devil seems to be whispering in our ear, well, how could you be saved? How could you possibly be saved if you did that? And he will try to get us to... To, to doubt that salvation because if we have doubts we're not going to be very effective for the Lord another reason is because we do sin or we struggle with sin and, and we've talked about that struggle that Paul was mentioning there in the seventh chapter of oh wretched man that I am and and sometimes we can just say how could I be saved if I'm really trying to deal with these things in my life or we could doubt our salvation because we actually go through some grave persecution. Well, why is this happening to me? Maybe it's because I'm not a child of God. I'll tell you, beloved, the devil will try to get you to doubt your standing with the Lord. He will try to do that. But it's a special work of the Holy Spirit to bring reassurance to the children of God. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And I thank the Lord for that. How does he accomplish this? You know, some people would look at that verse and just say, well, you know, the Spirit of God kind of brought a feeling into me, into me that I just know. Well, that's a pretty dangerous position if you're going to base your salvation or your hopes for heaven on feelings because every one of us can wake up tomorrow morning with, bad feelings. We had a bad night, we're grumpy, we need our coffee, <laughs> we stub our toe getting out of bed and we're not too saved in our actions, all right? But we don't go by feeling. It's not a warming that we have or just some, oh, I just know this. It's got to be more based on something else and of course it is the truth of God's word. He is the spirit of truth and the spirit bears witness with our spirit through the word of God. How does he, uh, you know, let me give you some scriptures. Turn over, if you would, to 1 John. This is the book of assurance. Good place to be. 1 John chapter 3, and uh, looking at verse number 19, the Bible says, And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. If you're doubting anything, whether it's your salvation or whether God loves you or whether God cares for you, you need to get into the word of God and let the spirit of God minister to your hearts the truth of what you're reading in the Bible. Look over in chapter number 5, and we often use this passage of scripture with a young Christian to show how you can know that you're saved. It's not a question of, well, I hope I'm saved, I think I'm saved. 
The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, and this is the record, this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You see, God put it in writing. This is the record. Suppose a man began to doubt his marriage. He looked at his wife and said, you know, I don't know if we're truly married or not. And she said, well, of course we're married. Can't you feel the love? He says, well, I don't go by feelings. I've got to have better proof than that. Well, what's he going to do to prove that? Well, he goes down to the county office where they keep a record. And he says, can I see my marriage certificate? And if the pastor remembered to mail it in, (laughs) it'll be there. And the county clerk, probably for a fee, would bring it out and say, well, here it is. It's in writing. You know, God has put our salvation in writing. It's in the word of God. And when we doubt, when we're unsure, it is the Spirit of God who is the Spirit of truth who will minister the Word of God and we will read things in the Bible and say, yes, I'm confirmed. God has shown me in his, by, in his Word. God has put it in writing and this is the record and these things have I written unto you. So the Spirit of God gives us the assurance and the confirmation that God is working in our life. Never forget that. We need to be people of the book. And as we put the word of God into our hearts and minds, the more God, the Holy Spirit, will bring to light those things. I want to say one thing in verse 16, if I may, about the grammar. You know, one of the things that we teach in Bible Institute and really just would teach any time is that the Holy Spirit is not an it. He is a person. And in fact, in John 14, John chapter 16, passages that we've read today, you will notice the use of the personal pronoun he or him. So why does the Bible use an it here? And also in verse 26, the spirit itself maketh intercession for us. Well, I wondered about that. I do know, of course, that in the Greek, the word for spirit, pneuma, is neither masculine nor feminine. It is a neuter, uh, a a noun. But uh, the word itself here in the Bible, and of course our Bibles are so accurate, and those translators of the King James knew English, they invented English, (laughs) they knew what they were talking about, that the word itself is a third-person intensive pronoun. It's a double pronoun that is used to emphasize another noun or pronoun. And the noun, of course, is the spirit. You could read that verse without the itself. The spirit beareth witness with our spirit. But by putting that word itself there, it just highlights that it is the spirit who bears witness with our spirit. It's a proper grammatical function. It's not a mistake. It's how it should be. I just thought I'd mention that because... I wonder about those things sometimes. Well, praise the Lord that the Spirit of God confirms the Word of God to our hearts. And then lastly, the Holy Spirit comforts us when we are perplexed. Is there something that you're having difficulty with right now? Something you can't fathom, you just can't figure it out? Perhaps it's a direction that you need to have. Lord, what do you want me to do? What should, I, what should I do? Where should I go? Or maybe you're struggling with a besetting sin and you're wondering, how can I get the victory over that? In fact, it gets to the point where it becomes very, very hard for you to pray. Hard to know what to pray for. Well, I got good news. Look there, if you would, at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. The Spirit of God prays for us. 
I ask you this question, could there be a better prayer partner or a better prayer warrior than to have the Holy Spirit making intercession for us? And, and consider what care he has for us because the Bible goes on to say, with groanings that cannot be uttered. And when you think of groanings, you think of great effort. You know, if you're trying to lift a, a heavy load, you, normally we groan, we grunt. That's what men do. It kind of makes it easier, I think, to lift. I don't know, but it, it, it's, it's indicative of great effort. You know, so often people say, oh, would you pray for me? Oh, sure, I'll pray for you. And we might or we may not. But prayer can be such a flippant thing. Uh, but... Uh, with the Holy Spirit, he takes it seriously. I mean, he puts effort into praying and, uh, and he prays for us. What care he has. That's why he's referred to as the comforter. That is a name for the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John fourteen eighteen, I will not leave you comfortless. He was talking about going back to heaven. In John fourteen sixteen, he said, and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. And that word comforter, it comes from the Greek word parakletos, which means literally someone who is called alongside to help. Have you ever had a hard time where you've been really upset, heartbroken, what a blessing it is to have a brother or sister in Christ or even a family member come and simply just put their arm around you. In times of grief, it's often difficult to know what to say, but one of the best things you can do is just to be there for someone. You don't have to always say anything. Sometimes we stumble over words when we try. What a comfort that is. You know, the Spirit of God is like that. When we go through times of trouble, of perplexity, and, and we just don't even know how to pray, how to start to pray, the Spirit of God comes and says, I've got this. I'll pray for you. And he does. He does. Now, the Bible says in verse 26, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. And I think in context, these infirmities are not referring necessarily to the struggles in this life you know we say well I've got I'm sick you know and uh, well that's that's an infirmity but I think in context it's talking about our struggles with the flesh the 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 world just trying to live for Christ how sometimes it becomes very difficult and he helps us in that time this is the message of chapter six, chapter eight that we have the Holy Spirit and the spirit of life, the, the law of the spirit of life lifts us above all of the cares and all of the pull of the world and the flesh and those that would oppose us. There are three facts about the divine comforter we need to see. Verse 27 says that he knows what's going on in your life. And that's something. Maybe you're saying, I wish he didn't. <laughs> but the Bible says, he that searcheth the hearts knoweth. And there's one thing about it, you can, you can keep things from others, you can keep things from your parents and so forth and, and you've got these little secrets but I'll tell you the Spirit of God knows exactly what's going on in your life. And he knows your troubles, he knows your struggles, all of that he knows, that's a start. But he also knows what the right path is for you, he has the answer. Because also in verse 27 the Bible talks about the mind of the Spirit. And I'll tell you, the mind of the Spirit is the mind of Christ, which is the Word of God, and the Spirit knows exactly the right thing to do. Even when we don't, He does. And then also we can be assured in verse 27 that whatever, uh, however He leads you, it will always be according to the will of God. The Spirit of God's never going to give you wrong direction. He's never going to give you wrong advice. People may, people often do. But the Spirit of God knows everything about you. He knows what you need. And he knows how to lead you into God's will. To me, that ought to be, bring big comfort. Because in life, we are all faced from time to time with massive decisions. And sometimes we're just stumped. Well, 
we don't know how to pray or what to pray for, but here's a prayer that we should pray, especially when we get to that stage. It's found in Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's the prayer we can pray when we don't know how to pray. Just turn it over to God and say, Holy Spirit, you're the one that's praying for me and you know what I need even when I don't. Just search me and make sure I'm right with you. That's the prayer we could pray. And certainly we thank God for his abiding presence and the comfort he brings. These are realities in the Christian life. You see, the gift of the Holy Spirit is one of the great blessings of our salvation. Yes, through the Son, we receive forgiveness, reconciliation, cleansing, justification. And by the Father, we receive the gift of eternal life and acceptance, and we're brought into a relationship with him as sons and daughters of God, and we have the promise of, in my Father's house there are many mansions. But it's in the Spirit of God that we have right now God's abiding presence to teach us, to guide us, and to comfort us. And for that, we ought to be very, very thankful. Consider these scriptures. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1, 7. And then 1 John 4 and verse 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. And beloved, when we yield to the Holy Spirit of God, it simply allows him to minister to us in all of these wonderful ways. And today we've looked here in this chapter that mentions the Holy Spirit so many times. And as I said this morning, it is the, the pinnacle of this first section of Romans. This is where we need to be. This is the chapter for us. We've seen the chapters leading up to it, but this is where God wants us to be, to enjoy and partake of all of the spiritual blessings that belong to us in Christ and through his Holy Spirit. So I trust that tonight your heart will be challenged and stirred and caused to yield even more to the will of God in your life so that you can enjoy these wonderful benefits. The preceding message was preached from the pulpit of Bible Baptist Church, Oak Harbor, Washington. You can find additional information about the church and our publications ministry on the web at bbcoakharbor.org. For further assistance with specific questions, please feel free to give us a call at area code 360-675-8311. Thank you for listening. Our prayer is that you received a blessing from the preaching of God's word.